Thursday night out, our December edition. Tonight we have Dr. Ian Burrow standing here to my left. The, home, the hometown crowd is here. Uh, so he's speaking on the Lenape and their ancestors in Hopewell Valley. It's the view from the Hopewell Museum. He's brought um, some artifacts, which you'll be able to see uh, later on this evening. So tonight's presentation, I'm really thrilled to say, is a result of the library's collaboration with the Hopewell Museum and the Hopewell Valley Historical Society. Uh, basically, and that is with the liaison made possible by um, the ever tireless Doug Dixon. And so Doug, really appreciate you for helping to make this um, happen. So big round of applause for Doug Dixon. So by, com by combining our publicity efforts and the tech expertise of Doug Dixon and his colleagues, we are able to reach a wider audience in tonight's hybrid format. Uh, we're pleased to note that over 95, I think maybe up to 100 now, people are pre-registered for Zoom. So in addition to the people we have here in the room tonight, which I haven't yet counted, we have uh, possibly 100 other people that are here to see you tonight. So we're very, uh, we're thrilled um, for that. So to tell you a little bit about Ian Burrow, I would have to speak uh, for hours longer than his talk is gonna be tonight. So I've just limited to this. He's a professional archeologist and a trustee at the Hopewell Museum. He was trained in the United Kingdom, um, moved to the United States in 1988 after a 10 year career in England as an archeologist. Uh, from 1988 to 2015, he was vice president of Hunter Research Incorporated carrying out numerous archaeological projects in New Jersey and the Mid-Atlantic. He lives in Hopewell Borough, uh, loves exploring the Sourland Mountains, local history, and the menu at Chubby's Luncheonette. So big round of applause again for welcome. <laughs> well, th thanks very much, everybody. Um, so th this talk this evening is really um, uh, a recognition of, of, a, of a, I think, uh, a considerable achievement by a group of us in the in the Hopewell Museum. Over the last 10 months, um, we have completely catalogued, examined, recorded, catalogued, documented our entire collection of about 1800 uh, American Indian artifacts um, and really, really identified them and, um, and found out what they are, how old they are, and as far as we can, uh, where they've come from. And I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, the people who are involved in that um, sitting in the audience here is our intern Richard Fallon, a student at uh, TCNJ, who uh, really probably did about 50% of the work altogether, I think. Um, and uh, we were ably assisted by uh, Kathy Burrow, uh, Bev Mills, and Sandy Brown, uh, museum volunteers. And we worked once a week for 10, 10 months to. Um, to get this done and you will see actually a copy of the printout of the catalog that we've created on the um, on the table over there. So what I want to do this evening is to um, um, just really uh, see how we can use this collection or how this collection and other sources of information uh, can tell us about um, the lives of the Lenape and their ancestors uh, in this, now in this area, and uh, not something you usually hear, you hear more general uh, talks, but we can start to talk a little bit now about the Lenape and their ancestors in this area. And one of the really exciting things for us uh, was to discover that we have really some pretty old artifacts in the collection. And these are our two oldest ones. Um, and, um, <coughs> Archaeologists have developed a whole system of terminology for naming the different shapes of points and projectile points and spearheads and arrows. Uh, and this, what, this type is known as a Dalton point. Uh, and as you can see uh, from up there, it's around 9,000 years old. Um, and it's probably, we know also that there are some even older artifacts that have been found um, in the Hopewell Valley area, but we don't have them uh, in the museum. Uh, collection. So what was a tool like that used for? Well, probably not as it is on this New Yorker cartoon, um, but, um, but the idea is that um, uh, 
these Dalton points were being used by people only just a few centuries after these Ice Age mammals had disappeared from this area, the mammoths and the mastodons, the giant beavers, the short-faced bear, and other exotic animals had only just recently disappeared from the scene, and there would still be elk, probably bison, woodland buffalo, um, and of course the white-tailed deer um, here for them to, uh, to hunt. And so this way of life goes on for a very long time with changes as we see, as we'll see as we go through. But I'm gonna jump right ahead now um, to what happened to bring this way of life to an end in this area. And if you go to public events these days, you will increasingly find um, an acknowledgement by um, the, the body that's doing the uh, presentation or the event, a land acknowledgement. And so my land acknowledgement is that Hopewell lies in the original homeland of the Lenape people. And it's important to remember this. Uh, and, um, and they are not gone. There are groups of Lenape Indians uh, dotted throughout the state of New Jersey. We are in touch with some of them. Uh, uh, to talk about our collections and how we should present uh, what we have here about their uh, way of life. So, um, so this is an important thing to remember, but this is, this is how, this is the process by which that uh, way of life, which did change over the centuries, was essentially brought to an end. And as you can see here, this is the date, the 30th of March, 1688, there's a group of American Indian leaders have probably uh, come down to Burlington Island, just off Burlington, um, in the new colony, in the new English colony of West Jersey. And they have put their marks to a deed of sale, not a treaty, a deed of sale uh, by which the local Indians around here in Hopewell, what we now call Hopewell, um, essentially transferred their rights to this land uh, to the governor of the West State of, of Colony of West Jersey, Jan Daniel Cox, uh, through the intermediary of a guy called Adlord Bowd. And you can see in the little box, it says the deed from the Indians to Adlord Bowd for the governor Cox. And these are uh, the bottom of this slide are the first few lines of this deed which survives in its original document in the New Jersey State Archives. And many thanks to Joe Clett and his staff for uh, getting us a co uh, this wonderful uh, copy. Um, and um, I'm not gonna read this out because it goes on and on, but you can see probably at the beginning, it says, to all people to whom this present writing shall come. And then there's a whole list of names. And then it says they're Indian Sacamax. Now, what is a sacrament? Hmm. Is what they sold. So it's the present day Hopewell Township, Ewing Township, and Trenton, north of the Assenfink Creek. A pretty extensive area. And from the descriptions in that document and in other documents, we learn some interesting little snippets about what it was like here immediately before European settlement began. If you look on the, uh, the top right of the map, you'll see Hopewell Borough there. And on either side of it, two little um, uh, buildings labeled Wissamenson and Minapanasson. And these are villages that were here in 1688. They're, they're within walking distance of where we are now. And um, so there were not just bands of Indians wandering around, there were settled villages in Hopewell Township uh, at the time that this sale took place. Not only that, if you look over to the left-hand side, right by the Delaware River there, you'll see another, another place called Atacoking's Wigwam. This is just one person's wigwam, but it's a well-known landscape feature at that time. You know, you go down there, turn left and up past 
ethical things with WAM. Um, so what we're dealing with, what we're seeing a quick glimpse of here in this 1688 document is the landscape that the Lenape knew and where they, where they were living. So the Sacamacas, who are these people? They are probably not uh, the people living around here because we find these, these uh, guys' names um, in a number of other documents or some of them at this same time period. These are the wise leaders of the wider tribe, if you like, people of the Lenape who have been entrusted by the local band here to negotiate on their behalf. These individuals here, these are their names written out as well as the English secretary could do it at the time, um, are, are um, wise elders who have understood that they are in an unequal fight with the English settlers who are coming in. It's not that there is literally fighting. This is not an area where we get big Indian wars or anything like that. But they understand very quickly that there are going to be so many English settlers and the English settlers have very clear ideas about what they want. They want the land. And um, so the Sacamacas are spending a great deal of time trying to get the best deal possible. Um, and uh, you may have different views. There are different views about what these people's motivation was or how well they did their job. Um, it's a kind of unequal exchange, of course, because they have little choice. But what this emphasizes is that there's agency involved. In other words, the uh, American Indians in this area are not passive. They know what's going on. They understand that they're going to be basically overwhelmed by the new incoming people. Um, and they say, we'll do what we can about it. So what did they do about it? Here's, here's a picture of one of these Lenape Sacamacas. This is from 1735, so it's not one of the ones on our document, but it gives you a sense of, of the sort of person we're talking, talking about. Uh, uh, obviously a venerated elder. At this point, he's wearing a, a blue European trade, trade blanket as, as, as a clothing, very, very much wanted. He has a sort of tobacco pouch or other kind of pouch around his neck, possibly containing some um, important um, um, charms, if you like, um, that are important to him. Um, and you can see his face is tattooed in various designs, including a wiggly one that looks a bit like a snake on his forehead, which we will come back to a bit later. So this is the deal. In return for Hopewell, Ewing, and Trenton north of the Ass and Pink Creek, this is what this group of Indians received. I'm not going to go through um, uh, all these, but the, 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 the first few are certainly of interest. Wampum is a sort of money made from uh, seashells, which had a definite value to it. And so 100 fathoms of wampum is uh, 106 foot lengths of beads strung onto string worth about 25 pounds sterling, uh, a fair amount of money at, at that time. The next three items are really items of clothing. They're woolen cloths of various types of, of weave and sophistication, all made in England, many of them in Stroud or the Stroud area in the Cotswolds of England, why one of them is called a Stroudwater match coat because they're from Stroud. Then we see 30 guns, these will be muskets, 20 kettles, metal um, cauldrons, shirts, linen shirts, stockings, woolen stockings, hatchets, tomahawks, two half anchors of powder, it's gunpowder, a hundred knives, lead, shot, an anchor of rum, not supposed to sell rum to the Indians, but happens anyway. Uh, pipes, needles, and so on. And here's, here's pictures of, of, of some of these. Um, 
So uh, bottom uh, left there, you see three pounds of red lead. This is very important for coloring. Red is a very important color in Lenape culture and earlier cultures, probably re representing life, blood, that kind of, that kind of, um, that kind of thing. And in the top center, you see um, uh, contemporary Indians in Maryland actually wearing these um, match coats as uh, robes, as robes and clothing. Um, and these were very greatly sought after because um, um, other types of rope made of buffalo or, or other furs were more difficult to prepare. And these were extremely versatile and valuable um, items. So what we're seeing already in 1688 is that the local Indians are very well aware of European trade goods and which ones they want. The guns to help them hunting, the kettles for, for cooking, um, all and the, cl the clothes for wearing, of course. Uh, and these have actually improved their lives quite a lot. The alcohol has not, naturally, um, but many of the other things are fully absorbed into the Lanape culture, which again shows how much agency these people are showing in trying to control their lives in a time which is very uncontrolled in many ways. This is a famous uh, part of a famous picture by Benjamin West, the death of General Wolfe at Quebec, but it shows uh, what a warrior of this, probably of this era, this is probably a, um, an Iroquois warrior, but this is very much what um, the local warriors probably would have looked like. And if you look at it carefully, you can see um, so many um, trade items. He has a musket, of course. He has a, a pipe tomahawk, which is lying on the ground just in front of his knees. He's wearing a trade blanket, which has got um, blue and red and looks like sort of orange color, which is, he's using as, as, as clothing. Um, he has red on his head and also in the feathers in his, um, in his head, headdress there um, and some wampum beads hanging um, next to his ear. You also see that he has many tattoos as well of various designs, including a squiggly one on his neck near his ear, uh, which might be uh, representing a snake or something of that kind. So if you encountered uh, one of the Lenape of this area in the late 1600s around here. Uh, he probably wouldn't be dressed as spectacularly as this unless he was going to war, um, but, but um, this kind of appearance. Um, I just want to go back a minute to the, to, to the, to the list here. Um, so there's the red lead near the bottom, 300 pipes, tobacco pipes, needles, for sewing, yeah, um, three anchors of tobacco. And of course, tobacco is nothing new to these people. They've been smoking tobacco for hundreds of years, but they found that the European tobacco pipes are very useful, they're, very, they're quite cheap, uh, and they work uh, very well. But the other thing I want to talk about with this slide is, can we learn anything about the specific people around here? from this list. And um, scholars who have looked into this think that you can, because the numbers of certain items may give you a rough clue as to how many people we're talking about. The probably one of the best ones is the 30 guns. Guns were very much sought after and, and, and wanted because, because of their value um, in hunting and probably every adult male would want to have one. So it may be that in this group of people that the Sacamacas have been working for, there may be about 30 adult males. So we're talking 30 adult males in the whole of Hopewell, Ewing and Trenton, north of the Assenpink. 20 kettles. Well, this is probably a female item because the women are the ones we know from ethnographic studies, we're the ones that are pre preparing the food. The men are hunting for it, of course. Um, um, so if we have 20 kettles, we may be looking at about 20 households. 
extended families, if you like. So that's another, another sign. 20 shirts, 20 males again, possibly, 40 pair of stockings, two pairs of stockings each for maybe the, the, the more senior males, 80 hatchets, well, that's a multiplier of 20, uh, um, and so on. Uh, and so what, we, what I think, and it's only really, it can only be a guess, um, is that we're dealing with a group of maybe about 150 people, including children and, uh, you know, uh, older adults and so on. So maybe about 120 people living in the whole area of Homewell Township in around 1688. So it's giving us some kind of, I can't swear to you that that's the case, but it, the impression you get from the work that other academics have done is that that would be the order of magnitude of people that would be living here at that time. And we do actually have some artifacts really which show this transition in the collection and particularly these two um, axes or tomahawks really, um, which were collected by uh, Carl Maple, who was a uh, man who lived on Cold Soil Road, just opposite Terhune Orchards actually, um, and for many years collected artifacts from his own property and also collected from other places as well. And in fact, fully two thirds of our collection at the Hopewell Museum is Carl Maple's materials that he donated at various times uh, in the 60s, 70s and 1980s. So we owe Carl Maple a, a great deal uh, of debt for his um, you know, very dedicated uh, collecting of American Indian artifacts. Now these two uh, are mounted in um, a very hard wood handles, as you can see, or shafts, but the actual axe blades are iron. Now iron was not something that um, uh, American Indians uh, were, knew how to work. Uh, this is a European thing, which is replacing the stone axes that they were using previously, an example of which you'll see on the table at the end. So this is another example of cross-cultural, you know, interaction going on. The uh, American Indians are saying, look, I, I, can you make us a blade like this, but in iron, and we can mount it in our, our own traditional uh, wooden shafts uh, like this. Um, these objects actually may come not so much from this specific area, but maybe up further north in New York State. But these kind of things would certainly have been being used in our area also. And then just to, just to resume, just to circle back a little bit to the two villages that I mentioned. If you look in this slide in the middle, you'll see future location of Hopewell Borough. This, amaz this is an extract from an amazing map produced by Joe Clett, uh, president of the museum, uh, showing um, the locations of the early um, um, land deeds really of, 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 of English settlers, mostly English settlers coming into this area in the late 1600s and early 1700s. And, um, but what we have also done on this map is to plot the location of the two villages I mentioned earlier, Minapanasan and Wissamensan. Um, so you can see how close they are to where we're sitting and standing this evening. Just either side of Hopewell Borough uh, are these two villages. And the other thing to note is that some of the very earliest settlers um, uh, obtained land or settled land very close to these villages. The most well known is Roger Park, who's down here at the bottom left, just, just to the left of the lettering the vicinity of the village of Wissamenson. And Roger Park was a doctor of the time. And the very strong tradition is that he deliberately wanted to be there so he could be close to the Indian village so that he could learn their herb lore of the, the, the healing herbs and, and other plants that the American Indians were using. So we're talking about um, a period of relationship uh, when um, there's, there's toing and froing, both sets of people are living uh, close to each other. Again, this isn't quite the picture that we sometimes have of um, the transition between 
American Indians and European settlement. This is what the, the houses would have looked like, the, the wigwams. Um, they're um, made of uh, curved uh, tree branches and then covered, when, in this case, with uh, tree bark and reeds or other grasses. Um, and um, they can hold a family, really, the, this size. There are bigger ones, but this probably holds, you know, a nucleated extended family. Um, and um, we have early ethnographic reports, um, I think from a couple of Swedish travelers who said that these were much more comfortable to sleep in than the houses that the English were building at the same time. Um, because it was very common, again, this is another example of how things were. Many of these early travelers accounts, they are traveling through New Jersey and they say, we spent a night with the Indians and we slept in one of the wigwams. A completely different image than what you will get from you know, the traditional idea of the relationships between American Indians and, and uh, colonists. It was quite expected that you would be able to get hospitality from the Indians as you traveled through the landscape. So that's the, how it all sort of came to an end. Uh, now I want to sort of start going back and talking more about our um, collection in the, in the museum. Um, so before we started this process, of course, we knew that we had a lot of American Indian artifacts and it wasn't, they weren't re recorded. They were all, most of them were accessioned. In other words, they were in the book that says, you know, in 1932, uh, um, so-and-so gave us 26 arrowheads made. But what we didn't get from that was a number of pieces of information that we would like. One, where exactly were they found? which we often don't know. Um, and also, you know, what, what, what are they? What can we say about them? What age are they? What type of object um, are they? We didn't, the, the accessioning system back that, that was used did not, it was mostly to track who'd given things to the museum. So it wasn't an analytical tool or any, anything or a quantifying tool. It was just a way of saying, yeah, oh, they gave this. So what our challenge was to, um, to re sort of reassemble all these accessions into their individual groups because they got a bit messed up over the years in some cases, and then go through and see what, what exactly do we have in terms of, of artifacts. And so these numbers that you can see on the screen now uh, give you a sort of, uh, as I say, by the numbers, 1886. Uh, individual items, of which nearly two thirds are projectile points. Now, archaeologists use this snooty sounding term projectile point because they're not all arrowheads. You people, you look at these things, oh, arrowhead, but many of them are not actually arrowheads. As far as we understand it, the bow and arrow only started to be used in this area about 2000 years ago. So we've got at least another 7,000 years when they're not using bows and arrows. So these things have got to be some other kind of, of weapon, a dart or a spear. And we'll see a bit of that in a minute. Um, the other thing that we found is there are 51 different types of these things. Um, there's a tremendous range of design, basically, in how these projectile points are made. And there's still a great deal of uncertainty as to exactly why this is. And it was particularly surprising to me coming from the UK and with some knowledge of the rest of European uh, prehistory of the same kind of time period, you have a very limited number of different types of stone arrowhead projectile point. But in North America, there must be hundreds and hundreds of different kinds. And so there's a real difference between the two continents in this respect. And I've never read anything that really explains this very well, although Richard did a really good paper about it for, for uh, his, his college classes on, on exploring this issue. And maybe I'll put you on the spot later, Richard, and you can explain why there are so many different kinds. Um, and um, so we've got, you know, uh, two thirds of the collection is projectile points, but we have a lot of other things too. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of axes, 
big axes. And again, we've got a couple of those on the table there. Um, hammer stones, which as they sound are things for hammering, hammering other things. Um, hoe blades for cultivating, we'll come to those in a minute. Uh, Atle Atle weights, another fascinating um, artifact, which we'll look at in a minute. And bowler stones, which is also displayed on the table there. Uh, pendants and gorgets, these are personal adornment items, uh, emphasizing that this, this isn't just a matter of, you know, brute survival. This, these are people who have a spiritual life and stories and uh, traditions and rituals and uh, practices that are largely lost to us now, but were very important to them at the time. And then, you know, utilitarian things, knives, scrapers, adzes, which is a woodworking tool, uh, pestles and mortars for crushing uh, vegetable matter to make it into uh, uh, grits and that kind of thing. And also in the, late, in the later period, um, ceramics, whoops, uh, ceramics, pottery, which starts to be used around 3000 years ago and gets much more common after about 2000 years ago in this area. One of the important things about ceramics is that it's an indicator of more stability, people remaining in one place for longer periods. You can't carry fairly fragile cake, clay pots around with you all the time. You'd much prefer to leave them somewhere and you know, use them in the fire or whatever. Carrying them around um, over long distances doesn't seem to be a very sensible or possible thing to do. So we're getting hints from the artifacts that people are starting to, rather than being roving bands of hunters, which they certainly were in the beginning, people are, are tending to concentrate and stay within one area more and more. And so this, is, this brings us back to the Hopewell sale, the deed of sale of 1688. We're dealing with the territory of that 150 people or so who probably had various locations they moved around to, but within this, within this Hopewell, within this Hopewell area. So they're, they're the first Hopewellians. Um, so what is it, what's involved with cataloging this stuff? Um, well, we all had to learn a great deal. Um, of course, there's lots of people gone before us with have written extremely useful reference guides to American Indian artifacts. And again, you'll see some of those on the table. Um, so our job really was to get all this stuff together and, and try and identify um, the artifacts by what the, <coughs> the archeological world generally accept, calls them or accepts them to be. And the way that we did this is that we recorded it onto Microsoft Excel spreadsheet um, and it's been transferred to uh, another another software called Past Perfect, which is the overall cataloging and registration system we're using in the museum. But the Microsoft Excel that you see on the screen here gives you a very, it's very useful for sort of quantifying and sorting and listing uh, and so on. And so this, this particular page here is sorted actually by what we call the collection. So this first uh, few entries here, you'll see are called Abbott Farm, Hopewell Township, well, Abbott Farm is actually on uh, Hopewell Amwell Road, um, just east of Hopewell. If you go out of Hopewell, you have Aunt Molly Road going off to the right, Hopewell Amwell Road off to the left, you go up there about half a mile, the road turns around to the right. And that's where the Abbott Farm is. There's still a big barn there. So that's, this is one of the collections. We know pretty much where the material comes from. In many cases, we really don't we can deduce that it's probably local by the person who collected it, he, Carl Maple. We know he loved collecting local stuff. And also from the raw materials of which the items are made. So we'll look at that in a minute also. And you can see going across the columns here, we have object ID, that's the individual identifying number for that particular object. And you'll see that on the object on the table. Uh, then we have a sort of general name projectile point, which you've already been introduced to. And then we get the other name, which is the specific name of that type, in this case of projectile point, that art archaeologists generally agree on. So in other words, you, 
I send a picture of a particular projectile point to a colleague of mine who's more expert than me, <laughs> and they'll write back, oh, looks like a lacquer wax in Ian. Um, and uh, that has all kinds of implications for gait and, and so on. Um, then we record the raw material that it's made of. In this case, many of these are argillite, which is a local raw material. Go half a mile up Greenwood Avenue and you can pull argillite out of people's walls, but they probably don't want you to. Um, and, um, and then we have the period. These, these periods are uh, spans of time that archeologists have used. It goes through early archaic, middle archaic, late archaic. And guess what? Early woodland, middle woodland, late woodland. Um, and uh, these are, have chronological time, time spans associated with them. So you can see when you've got all this is about 15 different columns in the, in the, um, in the catalog. Uh, and we can sort this in all different ways to, to quantify and compare uh, and get, get tease out more information about this, about this collection. So let's look at the raw materials, for example, first of all. Uh, we haven't been able to identify the raw materials of all the objects. It's just, just too many. And some of them are in cases, glass cases, that we can't really look at them closely enough. But of the ones that we have been able to look at, uh, and identify, you can see we've done this pie chart, which breaks down the, the, the types of raw material. And you can quickly see that there are four big ones. Uh, uh, top right, um, you know, on the right there is argillite, which I just mentioned, which is the most local raw material used by American Indians for tools. Um, then we get to cherts, which are very hard, Crypto crystalline rocks, like flint, flint is a sort of chert, very, very hard uh, material, very, makes very, very sharp objects. And that's the second most common. Then we have jasper, which is a type of chert, but a very, very distinctive one. It has a beautiful sort of caramel uh, color to it. And it, again, it makes really exquisite art, you can make exquisite artifacts out of it because it's so very fine and chips very well. And then going down the scale, we have quartz, which is the white sort of um, um, kind of material, which is used surprisingly often uh, for tools, possibly because it looks interesting. It's often, some quartzes are very, very white indeed, and, um, and, and, and it gets used. And then there's a whole range of other, other ones, some of which are local and some of which are not. And when we when we sort of look at where these things come from, this is a this is a map um, produced by uh, the late Herb Kraft, who was the archaeologist of the Lenape people. Uh, and his great massive tome uh, is on the table. That this is the Bible for archaeologists wanting to study uh, the archaeology of the Lenape uh, people. Anyway, he mapped out um, where some of these main uh, uh, stone types are, and you see, uh, we put a, a star where Hopewell is, as if you didn't know where it was. Um, and you can see there's argillite close by, uh, something called Cuesta Quartzite, scattered chert up in the middle there, uh, more cherts and slate, quartz over on Long Island, jasper down in the, uh, just in Northern Delaware there. So you can see that the bulk of the material that our artifacts are made of are, is from this region. Um, so we can be fairly sure that you know, we're dealing with stuff that local, it's local, it's pretty local. Most of it is pretty local. Argillite is my favorite, <laughs> um, partly because you can go and see it very easily. This is, this is a geological map of Sal and Mountain, and you see Hopewell Borough in the uh, right center there and then the green uh, the green band called the Lokatong formation is the is argillite that's that's the argillite outcrop and then north of that in bright red is the diabase you know the the real sal and mountain craggy rock stuff um, you won't see the argillite outcropping in quite that way because it's softer and has weathered more but any of the creeks and streams that run off the south 
through Sal and Mount, and you'll see this argillite exposed in the river banks and the river beds. So there'd be no problem about finding this stuff. You don't have to go and open a quarry or anything, just go to the nearest stream and there they are. And uh, the top uh, left-hand image there shows an, out, an actual outcrop of this argillite on the Cedar Ridge Preserve, which is just up uh, about a mile away or less from us here. Uh, and there's an outcrop and uh, some bad person hit this with another rock to shatter the rock so you could see what the color was. That was me, of course. Um, but you can, you, can see, you can see how sharp edge, how the, how the, the gray stone is not, the, the unweathered gray stone that I've broken off there has very, very sharp edges on. It doesn't look like this when it's been buried hundreds of years in the ground because it's eaten away by soil acids, unlike the cherts and the jaspers. Uh, so it looked some of the argillite artifacts we see are a bit sort of bleh, not much, but when they're brand new, they are absolutely as sharp as any other uh, raw material that you can name, except possibly obsidian. Now we have one or two pieces of obsidian, which is a volcanic glass, and it's only found out in the American West. Um, not sure whether these are, these may have just been given to the museum by somebody who thought they were nice. Um, there's a, um, an account of a surgeon uh, a number of years ago now who knew about this material, had to have some surgery done, and he gave the surgeon who was going to do the surgery on him obsidian blades to do the, as scalpels. And they were absolutely as good as the steel scalpels that were being used today. So you get a sense of how impressive some of these tools can actually, uh, actually be. So the projectile points, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and this just gives you some idea of the range of shapes and forms, not so much of sizes. We haven't got the, all these at the same scale, um, but you can see a, a very great difference in shape between the one at the top left, which is called a Jack's Reef a corner notched point. There'll be a quiz afterwards, by the way. Um, and the top right one, which is a very simple uh, triangle shape. Uh, it's called a Madison point. And this would have been the sort of arrow that you'd have been shot at with by the Lenape if you were coming into their area without permission in the 1600s. Uh, this was the, the type of stone arrow, this really is an arrowhead, uh, that was in use in the last few hundred years before European colonization. Um, the other thing you can see on most of these um, artifacts is the uh, item number. I know it doesn't look very attractive, but it, it means that we can immediately re refile these artifacts if we take them out to put them on display or anything. So what the numbers mean is, uh, let's use the one at the top right, for example, 2022, we actually created a new accession for some of these artifacts as we didn't really know what earlier accession they belonged to. So this is 2022 accession number 108, and it's item number 37 in that accession. So it's a unique number to that specific, um, specific artifact. Uh, another one to point out here is one of our uh, very old ones. This is the little pinkish one on the left-hand side uh, below the Jack's Reef corner notch point. Uh, and you can see this one has a little notch in its base with two little kind of almost like little ears sticking out. I guess. Almost like little ears pointing there and there. Um, and this is, a, this is about 8,000 years old. It's not quite as old as our Daltons, but it's still pretty old and it's called a LaCroix point. These names were usually created by archaeologists from the site where they found them. Oh, I was digging up at LaCroix, Pennsylvania, and I found this. And I think this is a, re I'm going to call this a LaCroix point. So that's how it, that's, it, it has no meaning in terms of the people who made and used it. We have no idea what they would have called these points if they indeed had different names for them or not. But um, anyway, that's how the names get, get applied. And this diagram, again, from um, Herb Kraft's book, just gives you some sense of the, the, the huge variety of shapes and in fact sizes but again you can't the sizes here aren't really um to, these aren't really to scale with each other um but um yeah the the, the chronology the chronology goes from the bottom 
to the top. So the oldest ones are at the bottom. We have um, uh, what's called a Clovis point right down at the bottom, which we don't have, but you'll see around 10,000 years ago, there are, there are our, Dalton, our Dalton points. And a little bit just up to the, up to the left of them are the LaCroix and St. Albans uh, points. Um, but as I said, we have 51 different recognized types of points. Absolutely amazing, really. Even though we're dealing with 9,000 years, it's still quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing some kind of analyses of this. Um, for example, what are the most popular points? You know, which ones have we got the most of and why might that be? Uh, that's definitely two questions. Um, and so this is, as I say, this is the top 10 projectile points that we, ha that we have. And not particularly surprisingly, the, the, the most numerous one is the one at the bottom, got a Lavanna point, and it's actually rather twinned with one four, four uh, rows up, the Madison point. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I have to skip that one. I, can't, I, I don't know why it's not showing up. It's looking beautiful on here. I'll... <laughs> I'll turn it round so you can at least get a sense of what the heck we're talking about here. It's a bar chart. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, well, anyway, um, I do have printouts of all this. And uh, so, let's see. Anyway, uh, well, we won't, we won't spend too much longer on that then, um, except to say that, um, you know, the, some of them we have, you know, 90 or more of particular types and then only 20 or 25 of, of some of the other ones. Um, so as, as you might expect, we have more of the later ones, but that's not completely true because this flat, this, the second one, 6,000 to 4,000 years ago, the lack of waxy point was nearly as many as those as there are of our, our um, <coughs> Madison and uh, Havana points, which are much more recent in date. So what does that mean? Think there's a lot of people around this time, maybe 20 years. Why are there so many of that particular type of projectile point at that time period? I wish I could answer these questions, but of course that's what archaeology is. It's constant research and 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 uh, doing things and getting new insights. Keeps us out, keeps us off the streets. Um and uh is this showing? Oh, good. This one actually does show up. This is a similar presentation of that information, um, where uh, what we've done here is to show the, uh, the time range of the, again, of the top 10 um, projectile points that we have. So you can see that there's a whole cluster, there's a time period around 4,700 years ago, years ago, when there's at least four, it must be five different types of projectile points in use in this area. What does that mean? What does it mean? Um, and so you, then you've got, so you've got this time period where there's a lot, and then, and then as you get further on in time, it shrinks down as only maybe two or one at a particular point, and there's a bug flying on the screen there. Okay. Um, and you see we have one poplar island at the top, which is in use for a very long time. Obviously, it worked well for it. Whatever its job was, it did it well. We have generation after generation after generation of making this poplar island type of point. And I don't, this is provisional. A um, bit of a gap here from about 2,000 years ago to about, say, 1,300 years ago. much, not many points. We do have some, but none of this top 10 lot. lot. The, the points that we have are much fewer in number in, for this time period. And what we also get in this general time period are some of the more what we might call exotic events. <coughs> so there's a time when um, there's some cool stuff coming into this area. They haven't got they don't seem to have quite as many projectile points or arrogance. 
uh, so don't know quite what this means, but it's but it's telling us something, I think, about something going on in that in that time period there. Uh, and then when you go and you get bingo, there appear are those two those little triangular points, the Madison and the Banner points, which uh, go go on being used actually right into the 1700s. Uh, they, they, they don't have stone arrow points, even though they don't have muskets, they're still using uh, bows and arrows as well. Um, so this is the kind of, you know, fun stuff that we can start to do now that we've got the artifacts um, uh, catalogued like this. So when I say uh, exotic materials, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. We have, we have sort of a, you know, a couple of dozen of objects which are clearly not, should we say, utilitarian. At least we can't see what their utilitarian use was. This is what archaeologists call a boat stone. It's a bit shaped like a boat. Um, uh, and, but you see it wouldn't float because it's got two holes carved in it, which probably suggests it's intended to be hung around your neck or something like that. Um, this one is probably not from here. This is Carl Naples writing, but it says IND. I don't think it means Indian, I think it means Indiana, probably. He did collect some from some of their areas too. Um, but you can see also that the person who made this object, which is, you know, eight centimeters long, you know, um, chose a very uh, interesting looking stone, but with all the varying um, bags of different color. Uh, on it. This object was obviously, and it was made by polishing it time, um, <coughs> on, on, a, on an abrasive surface or piece. So. It's had a lot of time and care spent on it, hollowing it out was probably difficult. You can see kind of sort of sweeping that you had to do. Um, so this is an object that's had a lot of Oh, I'm sorry, you won't be able to hear me if I haven't got the microphone. Um, uh, somebody's had a lot of time and effort put into making it. Uh, e even to us, I think it's a beautiful object. Um, and so it's, it's really loaded with meaning, but we can't capture the meaning uh, very well at this point. And here are some other ones that aren't, aren't, aren't quite as fancy, but, but uh, still uh, pretty interesting. The ones at the top left there are stones that have had holes bored through them um, and again possibly for suspending them in some way and th these are made of an interesting type of stone called steatite, sometimes also called soapstone. And this outcrops in southern New Jersey and Delaware and you can actually carve it, it's very soft stone, you can actually make bowls out of it. Um, and um, so it's an interesting material and it's called soapstone because it does feel kind of soapy when you handle it. So these may have been something that was uh, interesting and, and uh, got up here. Uh, below them is, is this reddish object with a hole bored through it, uh, which we tend to call a gorget. Again, something to be hanged, suspended around your neck. And then on the top right, who knows what this is for? This is a... Um, this is a very finely made um, object. You can consider how difficult it would be to chip this, to make this shape without breaking it. And in fact, it has, you can see it's had, it's been mended on the, on the left-hand side there, but not, but, but in the museum, not, not, not by the person that, that made it. Not super sharp, but fairly sharp. Um, and, um, you know, a puzzle, another puzzle but when we're seeing these puzzling things, we're getting an insight into, you know, the inner lives of these people. These are items of importance, um, not just utilitarian. And um, so they're trying to tell us, however difficult it is for us to hear, they're trying to tell us something about the, the, the more co the complex social, spiritual, religious life that these people undoubtedly had. And we get some very nice, a few examples of stone tobacco pipes like this. These, these were made before. Obviously Europeans arrived with their white clay tobacco pipes. Uh, and these are quite big and they're various, various designs. 
uh, and they're probably around a thousand years or so or less in, in age. Um, but um, uh, again, beautifully made, see how finely polished that, that thing is, how, how much time it's going to take you to, to produce something like that. So we've got this time period, as I say, where we many of those items I've just showed you seem to fall in that period where there weren't many projectile points. I wouldn't want to make too much of this, but it's it's a line of inquiry that we can um, we can pursue. But just to just to do a quick kind of run through of some of the other artifacts and and what they kind of mean, uh, start with these two lovely. Um, stone axes which were both found on Saul and Mountain. Uh, one of them was found by our archivist Benita Grant and she graciously donated it to the museum. That's the one at the top and and the um, the one at the bottom, it's two, two views of it, uh, was found um, um, on the farm on Route 518. Um, so these these are two artifacts. We know exactly where they were found, exactly where they were found, which is rare, really, for many of them. So what are these things? Well, they are, as it says, it says they are grooved axes and specifically full grooved axes. So in other words, they are a, they are a cobble. It's something they found in the stream, probably in a stream, which looks pretty much what they're looking for. And then it is painstakingly sharpened. And even more painstakingly, a groove is made right around it, which is for hasking it, for holding it in a handle so that you can use it as an axe. And again, there's a, I think I've got a picture of this one. I don't know where that. Um, and um, some of these are not full groove, they are three quarter groove because it's an awful pain doing a groove all the way around. If we do it three quarters of the way around and put a wedge underneath, that'll hold it well enough. So I think that the three quarter axes uh, come in a bit later when people realize they're spending an awful lot of time on this. As I said, the production method of this is what we call peck and grind. So you have your basic cobble, you know what you want to do with it, sharpen one end, possibly keep the other end as a hammer, a flat end that you can hit things with. And you're going to shape it by, uh, first of all, hitting it multiple times to pulverize the surface and make it into the shape you want. And in the, particularly in the grooves, you can see all the pitting from that process. You had to be doing something else, watching television or something while you're doing this, I think. Um, took a long time. And then also a grinding, you know, getting a, a, probably a piece of sandstone or some uh, stone and some sand and some water and just, you know, just doing this long time until it's um, until it's the shape that you want it to be. <clears throat> These are both made of argillite, so they were made using the local uh, material. It varies in color, as you can see a bit. So now what are these what are these things really for? What why do they start to be made? They, you know, there's a period when they aren't in existence and then around 5,000, 6,000 years ago, they appear on the scene. And I uh, say, so, well, what's, what's going on now? Well, obviously there's become a need or a wish to chop things, probably mostly wood. In the past, we'd have called these tomahawks or war axes or something like that. They're probably basic tools that you're using in your daily life. But what it is telling us, I think, is that at this point, people are taking a little more control of their environment. They're starting to cut trees down and possibly make clearings intentionally uh, to encourage the deer to come and graze so you can stick your spear in them. Um, and using wood for a range of other purposes as well, more than has been done in the previous 3000 years or so. So you're seeing a bit of a change in the culture at this time uh, with these things coming in. They're very common. They're, there are dozens and dozens. We have 60 of them in the museum. Uh, the State Museum has literally hundreds of them, I think. They, are, they were very common. Uh, and, and, and when they were broken, they were dropped and discarded and you went and got another one. After a while, that technique uh, is abandoned and you get a new uh, way of making axes and, and archaeologists call these celts, C-E-L-T-S, and they are made and they made much, much smoother and thinner 
and they are hafted in a slightly different way. And again, in the table at the back, you'll see this. These start to come in, I don't know, about 3,000 years ago, uh, and they take over from the, the grooved axes that we were seeing on the last uh, thing. So again, you ask, well, why did that happen? Why did they start to change the, the technology? It's a, the tool has the same purpose, but it's being made in a different way. Oh yes, we do have pictures of how this worked. So here's a, here's a celt on the left, uh, really basically wedged into a wooden handle of a substantial um, you know, branch, the hole carved in it, jammed in there and wedged. And that seems to be good enough. There've been experimental archeology span of this and you can, you can cut trees down with one of these. And there are actually complete examples that have been found um, you know, where, where, where the environment is appropriate, wet, very wet environments, the wood sometimes survives. So you have both the stone uh, ax head and also the handle. So we can know very well what these really look like. And then on the right, you see how a grooved ax was hafted. Um, you basically pass a, either some, in this case, um, a lath of wood, or it could be raw hide or any other material, lash it around the, um, the ax head and then tie it very tightly to a, to a handle below. Probably not quite as effective, um, um, but easier to do because you don't have to go around looking for the right piece of wood all the time. Um, but anyway, both of these things, very effective at chopping up wood. They work, they work. Then we get on to uh, looking at um, uh, hunting, which has remained a very important part of life for a all, all throughout the period we're looking at, but was getting slightly less important towards the end. But um, uh, in the sort of what we call the archaic period, particularly like from about, uh, let's say, 6,000 to 2,000 years ago, something like that, um, these, um, before the bow and arrow comes in, you have the atl atl. I love saying that word, atl atl. Right? It's actually a Mexican uh, Aztec word, I believe. Um, and it means spear thrower. And so what you're dealing with here, as I said, it's a long range, long range missile system. You have a spear thrower, which is a piece of, which is a long piece of, of, of wood with a, a hook at the back and a stone mounted towards the back of it, as you can see on these pictures. And you place your spear or your dart on this spear thrower and you, you throw it like that and you can get a greater range and speed and energy from just throwing it by hand. These stones, which we call atl atl weights, are usually bored right the way through so that, the, so that they can fit onto the atl atl spear, spear thrower of, uh, artifact. They're thought to be sort of counterweights <coughs> it may be that they helped with the acceleration of the, when you're throwing, but another good explanation is that these hunters are probably standing for long periods of time like this, waiting for the deer to come. Same way as you'll see um, pictures of Inuit Eskimos waiting patiently by seal blowholes for hours and hours to get a chance at a throw. Um, and um, so these, whatever their purpose was specifically, a lot of time and attention was paid to making them. Some of them are absolutely beautiful, much more complex than these in shape, although many of them have this sort of whale tail appearance like this. They were obviously regarded as very special objects, probably endowed with kind of magical powers, if you like, to help you throw accurately and well. Um, so these are uh, both, both utilitarian objects and very beautiful special ones too. And here are some other examples where you can see how very smooth the stone has been made for these. These are all broken, of course, but you can see the grooves uh, for where the atl atl shaft uh, would go go through. Um, and these these are made of um, some sort of jadeite stone. Again, probably not local. Uh, but these things may have been traded over long distances or gifted, you know, as people interact with each other. 
So that's hunting going on for a very long time. And then gradually, um, in the last 2000 years or so, we see uh, the beginnings of what we would think of as maybe uh, agriculture. In other words, people deliberately cultivating crops in specific locations. Up until that time, it's been a, a, a gathering um, mode of getting vegetable foods. You know where things grow, you know when the chestnuts are coming down over there, uh, you know when the goosefoot is flowering. So you're, you're going around and, and gathering these things, but gradually there's more and more of an interest in staying in one, more in one place and growing three particular crops, maize, corn, beans, and squashes. And um, these are called the Three Sisters. These were the fundamental foundation of American Indian agriculture all down the east coast of the US, of, America, of North America. Uh, the Three Sisters, they're grown together on a little mound because they sort of complement each other and help each other. And um, as well as the continuing traditional foods like nuts and, and other seeds and things like that. And so we begin to see these things, uh, pestle and mortars for grinding stuff up, to make it more edible, to make it into stews or like grits, that kind of thing um, for, for food preparation. And again, this is probably our heaviest artifact in the museum. It probably weighs about, I don't know, 25 pounds, Richard, you think? Anyway, it's very heavy. So I didn't, br I didn't bring it this evening. Um, uh, but it's a mortar and this is a pestle or the, 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 the grinding, the, the pounding stone to go in. it. And of course, this type of artifact still exists in many cultures today, particularly in, uh, in Latin America. Still, these things are still used uh, in, in slightly more modified form. And with this um, cultivation um, uh, perspective, uh, we find this type of tool and some of these things really don't look like anything at all really do they they're very roughly made but you see the ones at the top left the two at the top left you can see they have a sort of shaft part and then a wider part at the bottom and these are hoes for cultivating the ground so these are a definite a definite demonstration that what we have here our guard, what we might think of as garden plots or small fields, which are being cultivated and weeded with the hoes. And um, so when we find these in Hopewell Valley, which we do, we can be sure that the three sisters were being cultivated in our area in the last few hundred years before European um, uh, colonization. Um, and, um, oops. That's sort of how it works. They're mounted at an angle on a wooden shaft and, and lashed, lashed to a piece of wood. Uh, and they're used in combination with other tools uh, for planting and cultivating and weeding. And again, from ethnographic descriptions in the, 17, in the 1600s and 1700s, we know that this was the work of the women. The men cleared the land. They got cut the trees down and all that stuff but the women were the ones that were responsible for bringing the life out of the ground by gardening and cultivating. And so these hoes are very, what anthropological archeologists call it an engendered artifact. They're a female artifact. It prob probably would be very bad bongos to actually handle one of these if you weren't female uh, uh, in, this, in this society. Um, but they they turn up all over the place. Some of them much better made than others. They were probably not in use for very long time. If you can imagine, if you keep hitting other stones with the hoe, it's going to shatter. And um, so they're not very carefully made because they're a sort of throwaway kind of item. And again, you can imagine when iron hoes come in with the Europeans, they go, oh, this is a huge improvement. Oh, thank goodness for Europeans and their iron hoe blades. Um, so uh, though, though that's, that's uh, an artifact that speaks, that tells us quite a lot. I'm running a little over time, but I know you don't mind. Um, just to finish up with talking a bit more about the spiritual and religious life of these people and, and how can we begin to get at that. 
We have some of these artifacts that we've seen that's probably significant, but increasingly people are identifying landscape features in the landscape outside in the woods that may be something to do with this. It's rather a controversial topic at the moment. This is one location, um, Oli Hills in Berks County, Pennsylvania, where are these very strange stone cairns and mounds uh, built on top of, um, of, uh, of boulders. Some people think these are just European farmers clearing the land, but there's so many of these, and there are so ma many different kinds of things, that it is beginning to look as if there are, these are non-functional um, structures made in the landscape. So this is saying a lot about, you know, thought, you know, the thought world of what, what is, what is, why, why is this being done? It doesn't probably have a practical purpose in the sense it doesn't help you get more food directly anyway. Um, so with that knowledge in mind, um, <clears throat> I started to look at Sowell and Mountain over the last few years. And Sowell and Mountain, of course, has some very interesting natural rock formations on it, like these ones, the Three Brothers Rock Formation up on uh, Greenwood Avenue, up, up on the hill there, near uh, Hillbilly Hall, <laughs> um, and these three perched rocks. And these were great, obviously, uh, a place to go on a Sunday afternoon 100 years ago. And it's a weird landscape up there. If you've walked on the, the higher parts of Salem Mountain, you've seen all these weird boulders just lying around, chaotically lying on the surface. What a strange place this is. There's nothing much else you can do up there. There's no animals up there because there's, the vegetation is crummy, much better pasturage further away. So there's not much you can do up there except go and say, ooh, what amazing rocks. So when I was walking along the Rock Hopper Trail near Lambertville uh, three years ago now, um, I, cross, I was going on this trail which crosses at the top of this picture and I looked to my right and I saw this line and setting of stones. And first of all, I just thought, well, okay, line of stones on the ground. <clears throat> but I took this first picture of it and you can see the line of stones winding away um, into the distance. And then a few months later, I brought a friend of mine and a leaf blower up and we uh, blew all the leaves away from all around it just to make sure we weren't making it up, you know, not joining A and B and making life. But sure enough, here it is. It's a, a winding line of stones. In some places it's up to three courses high, but mostly it's just one course high. It winds across this hillside for about a hundred feet. And at this end, the closest end here, you can see on the left, there's a definite sort of opening out and a sort of setting of about five stones making a wider um, shape. And that's just a view of the, another piece of the, of the line. And here's a, a fairly rough um, map of it. We've also got um, drone photographs of it now from, from colleagues of mine. But, and I haven't drawn all the stones on this drawing, but on the right, at the right hand end, you can see the setting uh, the, the wider setting of about five stones and then the rest of it just winding away and it ends up at the label P5 which is a ma fairly massive boulder and it seems to stop at that boulder. So <clears throat> what is this? Well I'll cut to the chase. I think it's a serpent effigy. Uh, I don't know how old it is but I'm pretty sure it's made by American Indians. If I had to guess, I'd say it was between 1,000 and 2,000 years old. It's the only one so far that we've definitely identified on Salem Mountain, but there almost certainly will be more things like this discovered as we, as we look into the, into the woodlands up there uh, as time goes on. And this is so far unique in New Jersey, um, and therefore it's, it's more difficult to convince people that it's real, you know? Uh, the, the, begin, the first time the claims have to be well justified. So somebody can come along and tell me, no, it isn't that, it's something else. But my, my interpretation of it based on 
what I've read from elsewhere, New England and the Midwest, and what I see and uh, talking to other people who are interested in these things, I think this is a snake effigy. And I think it may have been made as part of a vision quest process. You may know about this, particularly male warriors go off into some distant remote area and hope to have an inspirational dream where they will identify their spirit animal and support them in their life. Whole range of different purposes for this, but like a, a definite religious activity. And it might be that somebody would build something like this after they've had a vision, which included a snake, and then maybe you tattooed one on your head. I'm, you know, you can see I'm jumping ahead quite a lot here, but, but this is exciting. This is a very exciting discovery. I discovered it completely by chance. Um, so there's got to be more out there. It's, this one just happened to be crossed by one of the trails. Uh, so the other ones which are out in the woods, much more difficult. So I hope that's given you uh, something of, a, of an overall sense, A, of what we've got in our museum. And uh, to emphasize that this is just part of the re-envisioning process that's going on in the museum now. I don't know whether any of you were able to get to our tea last Sunday, but you'd have seen some of the other exciting research that's going on in the museum now, particularly with our documents, which we have incredible range of, and our other collections. It's taking a long time because of COVID and because we're all volunteers. And so it's frustrating for us, frustrating for you that the museum is open, but we are doing stuff. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty interesting stuff altogether. So anyway, I hope you'll spend a few minutes looking at the artifacts at the end. And um, uh, I'm, we turn the lights up, we can have some questions. And also if there's questions on the chat bar, um, we can hear some of those also. So is it possible to turn the lights up now? Thank you very much. Is this so you can see where I am? Yeah. So, um, any questions? Yeah. Where, where are the two villages? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Is my voice loud enough? Anyway, can I can I take this off and walk around with it? Ooh, so cool. That's true. This is working. Okay. Is this okay? Or do you want to get it on the on the? You want to get it on the Zoom, right? I'll be with you shortly. Thank you very much. Um. Okay, coming through. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the question was the where the village is. So um, I'm not going to give you very precise indications, not because I don't trust any of you, but there's always the possibility that somebody might take it into their head to go out there and start, you know, digging, trying to find arrowheads or something out there. Which we want to try and preserve these places if we can. But um, one of them is up Stony Brook Road. If you go down 654 um, uh, out of Hopewell westwards. Um, you come to Stony Brook Road, turn right on that. Um, that will take you past the old golf course. <clears throat> and soon then you'll see the Mine Road Bridge. There's a, a truss bridge there going Mine Road, taking you up to Route 31. And uh, Minapanason, um, uh, sorry, Wissaminson, was probably over to the right. If you, as you're going north up um, Stony Brook Road there, there's a whole area of rather open pasture fields, very beautiful piece of landscape. It's probably in there, it's in there. And similarly, um, Minapanascon, if you go up Hopewell Amwell Road, uh, right to the junction where it joins with, I guess it's Province Line Road, is it there? Um, again, you've got a beautiful vista over the valley there. There's some beautiful old barns in the bottom of the valley, beautiful uh, pasture fields in a valley there, that's almost certainly, I think, where Mena Panascon was. Joe. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that, this is always a um, uh, something that do people, people do ask because we've got used in the last few years to using the term Native American, and that's still used. Um, there's actually a piece of legislation called the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, 
Um, but round here, the Lenape descendants that we've talked to have said they prefer to be called American Indians. So that's why we do it. But, it's, but the other term isn't wrong, um, but uh, I think one of the perspectives of American Indians is that we are American, we are Indians, we are here. If we're no more native than, well, we are no more native than other people, but we are, we are American Indians, you know, and that, that seems to be the thinking. But don't, don't be embarrassed to say Native American if you want to, that's perfectly okay too. Thanks. Yeah. Of the Lenape, I would say Herb Kraft's book, which is the big, the big book on the table there, uh, he goes into this a lot, and he also spent a lot of time um, going out to Oklahoma, where many of the, the Lenape ended up, you know, with all the multiple migrations through time, uh, and he was very good friends with a woman called Falling Leaves, and she talked to him about a lot of things, so there's a great deal of, um, of that information in, in that book, and that would lead you into other um, references as well. Yep. Have there been any uh, Lenape burial sites or even traditional Not that I know of, no. You'll sometimes hear people say, oh, that was an Indian burial ground, but but it, there's really no no specific evidence at all that, I, that I'm aware of, no. I mean, it must have existed, of course, because we do know that, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to correct myself slightly. There are, there are some, some, um, um, American Indian burials have been found in Trenton, actually, which would be within the original uh, area. In fact, un underneath, um, right next to the St New Jersey State House, amazingly enough, Thomas Edison University, <laughs> when they were when they were extending the buildings there a number of years ago, uh, Hunter Research, my company, uh, did excavations there, and we did identify two two burials. And they were, you know, we recorded them, documented them, and then returned them to the descendant communities. Uh, of course, there's a very great sensitivity to um, burials among the American Indian community because of the way that they've been treated in the past, you know, been ransacked, looted, and the skulls lined up in museums and this kind of thing. So, so you can understand uh, why. So there must, there must be um, um, burials around. Uh, well, graves around, but um, those are the only ones that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question because I mean, there's always the thing, how do, you, how do you know it's anything? Um, if you see, there's, there's, I brought one example this evening. If you look at it carefully, you can see it has been deliberately chipped and shaped, quite roughly, but enough to shape it. So um, that's usually the clue. You'll be, it's been hit in a way that doesn't happen naturally. Let's put it that way. Uh, usually just one side. You have sort of one side flat and you sort of chip it off around so that you'd have a, so you'd have a, a bit of a, an edge on it but without having to chip it on both both sides. It's not to say though that some of them weren't what we call expedient, you know, say we can use that, we don't have to do anything to it except lash it to a piece of wood. So you could get, you could have that as well, but there are definitely manufactured ones, but it was probably a pretty quick process, you know, say, look, can you make this into a hoe for me? Clack, 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 there you go. We always think, I always imagine that there were in every community, there was somebody who was the person who made the tools, who was really good at it. Um, could be a man or a woman. That's a that's a another interesting question. Anyway, yes. Yeah, yeah. I was about to ask you guys Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> good question. <laughs> yeah. Oh really? Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. No, I. I, I, I don't. That'd be great to, great to to track that down. 
Yeah. That's a great question. I can't really answer it because we don't know tightly enough where these things have been found, but I would suspect, yes. I mean, I would, if we, if we could, if we could have a time machine and go back to say 1600 AD, uh, I'm pretty sure those villages would be there. That's pretty good soil. It's on the argillite and better soil, certainly not up on the top of Salmon Mountain. And it's south facing, well-drained, um, pretty good soil. So I would, I would guess if, if those fields were ever to be replowed again and what you walked over them, that'd be a great place to find them. But that, that's an excellent, excellent question. Yeah. yeah. Yes, right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Ian, you're yeah. very popular. Okay, we're gonna right, have to we're stop. Gonna, we're gonna, gonna run us out. So um, we're gonna have to have you back for more. And just wanna leave a few minutes if we wanted to see the art. Sure, and, and things that appear, if there was questions on the chat, um, if I can get hold, if I can get them, Doug, I can, I can possibly answer people uh, you know, um, by email or something, so. Be happy to do that. Anyway, thank you all very much and please have a look at the stuff.